This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to see how you can help this project, please see LibriVox.org. Today's reading by Alex Foster, www.alexfoster.me.uk. A Journey to the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne. Chapter 25 De Profundis. I therefore awoke next day, relieved from the preoccupation of an immediate start. Although we were in the very deepest of known depths, there was something not unpleasant about it. And besides, we were beginning to get accustomed to this troglodyte life. I no longer thought of sun, moon and stars, trees, houses and towns, nor any of those terrestrial superfluities which are necessities of men who live upon the Earth's surface. Being fossils, we looked upon all those things as mere jokes. The grotto was an immense apartment. Along its granite floor ran our faithful stream. At this distance from its spring the water was scarcely tepid, and we drank of it with pleasure. After breakfast the professor gave a few hours to the arrangement of his daily notes. First, said he, I will make a calculation to ascertain our exact position. I hope after our return to draw a map of our journey, which will be in reality a vertical section of the globe, containing the track of our expedition. That will be curious, uncle, but are your observations sufficiently accurate to enable you to do this correctly? Yes, I have everywhere observed the angles and the inclines. I am sure there is no error. Let us see now where we are. Take your compass and note the direction. I looked and replied carefully, southeast by east. Well, answered the professor after a rapid calculation, I infer that we have gone eighty-five leagues since we started. Therefore we are under mid-Atlantic? To be sure we are. And perhaps at this very moment there is a storm above, and ships above our heads are being rudely tossed by the tempest. Quite probable. And whales are lashing the roof of our prison with their tails. It may be, Axel, but they won't shake us here. But let us go back to our calculation. Here we are eighty-five leagues southeast of Snaefell, and I reckon that we are a depth of sixteen leagues. Sixteen leagues, I cried. No doubt. Why, this is the very limit assigned by science to the thickness of the crust of the earth. I don't deny it. And here, according to the law of increasing temperature, there ought to be a heat of 2,732 degrees Fahrenheit. So there should, my lad. And all this solid granite ought to be running in fusion. You see, that is not so. And that, as so often happens, facts come to overthrow theories. I'm obliged to agree. But after all, it is surprising. What does the thermometer say? Twenty-seven and six-tenths, or eighty-two degrees Fahrenheit. Therefore the savants are wrong by two thousand seven hundred and five degrees, and the proportional increase is a mistake. Therefore Humphrey Davy was right, and I am not wrong in following him. What do you say now? Nothing. In truth, I had a good deal to say. I gave way in no respect to Davy's theory. I still held to the central heat, although I did not feel its effects. I preferred to admit in truth that this chimney of an extinct volcano, lined with lavas, which are non-conductors of heat, did not suffer the heat to pass through its walls. But without stopping to look up new arguments, I simply took up our situation such as it was. Well, admitting all your calculations to be quite correct, you must allow me to draw one rigid result therefrom. What is it? Speak freely. At the latitude of Iceland, where we are now, the radius of the Earth, the distance from the centre to the surface, is about 1,583 leagues, let us say in round numbers 1,600 leagues, or 4,800 miles. Out of 1,600 leagues, we have gone 12. So you say. And these 12 at a cost of 85 leagues diagonally. Exactly so. In twenty days. Yes. Now sixteen leagues are the hundredth part of the Earth's radius. At this rate we shall be two thousand days, or nearly five years and a half, in getting to the centre. No answer was vouchsafed to this rational conclusion. Without reckoning, too, that if a vertical depth of sixteen leagues can be attained only by a diagonal descent of eighty-five, it follows that we must go eight thousand miles in a southeasterly direction, 
We shall emerge from some point in the Earth's circumference, instead of getting to the centre. Confusion to all your figures and your hypotheses besides, shouted my uncle in a sudden rage. What is the basis of them all? How do you know that this passage does not run straight to our destination? Besides, there is a precedent. What one man has done, another man may do. I hope so, but still, I may be permitted. You shall have my leave to hold your tongue, Axel, but not to talk in that irrational way. I could see the awful professor bursting through my uncle's skin, and I took timely warning. Now look at your aneroid. What does that say? It says we are under considerable pressure. Very good. So you see that by going gradually down and getting accustomed to the density of the atmosphere, we don't suffer at all. Nothing except a little pain in my ears. That's nothing, and you may get rid of even that by quick breathing whenever you feel the pain. Exactly so, I said, determined not to say a word that might cross my uncle's prejudices. There is even positive pleasure in living in this dense atmosphere. Have you observed how intense sound is down here? No doubt it is. A deaf man would soon learn to hear perfectly. But won't this density augment? Yes, according to a rather obscure law. It is well known that the weight of bodies diminishes as fast as we descend. You know that it is at the surface of the globe that weight is most sensibly felt, and that at the centre there is no weight at all. I am aware of that, but tell me, will not the air at least acquire the density of water? Of course, under a pressure of 710 atmospheres. And how, lower still? Lower down, the density will still increase. But how shall we go down then? Why, we must fill our pockets with stones. Well, indeed, my worthy uncle, you are never at a loss for an answer. I dared venture no farther into the region of probabilities, for I might presently have stumbled upon an impossibility, which would have brought the professor on the scene when he was not wanted. Still, it was evident that the air, under a pressure which might reach that of thousands of atmospheres, would at last reach the solid state, and then, even if our bodies could resist the strain, we should be stopped, and no reasonings would be able to get us on any further. But I did not advance this argument. My uncle would have met it with his inevitable sac nusem, a precedent which possessed no weight with me. For even if the journey of the learned Icelander were really attested, there was one very simple answer, that in the 16th century there was neither barometer nor aneroid, and therefore sac nusem could not tell how far he had gone. But I kept this objection to myself, and waited the course of events. The rest of the day was passed in calculations and in conversations. I remained a steadfast adherent of the opinions of Professor Liedenbrock, and I envied the stolid indifference of Hans, who, without going into causes and effects, went on with his eyes shut wherever his destiny guided him. End of chapter 25 Recorded in Nottingham, England, on the 16th of January 2006, by... Alex Foster www.alexfoster.me.uk